Our featured speaker is Diana Anna Kanan to speak about radio and microwave astronomy. Diana, I'm going to turn over the screen to you. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, some of my story on, um, on my involvement in radio astronomy and some things that I have discovered about it that I, I, I really enjoy. So I am going to start by starting the slideshow. And then I will share my screen. Share screen, share screen, share. Is that good for everyone? It's good. All right, let's get the little pointer up as well. There we go. All righty, so uh, <clears throat> I could have, you know, I, the, the radio astronomy was uh, part of my PhD thesis. I, uh, I observed and analyzed uh, data on microquasars in the radio and x-rays. And um, I find radio astronomy fascinating. And there are so many aspects of radio astronomy I could have discussed and shared with, with you all. But one of the things that intrigues me so much is the history of radio astronomy and how we got to the stage of uh, capturing cosmic radio waves. So I'd like to share some things with you of um, aspects uh, that I've learned along, uh, along the years. So, the radio universe is populated with all kinds of neat objects. Just about any object you, you care to mention emits radio waves. We have, you know, the sun is a radio emitter, the cosmic microwave background theoretically is the whole Milky Way galaxy. We have radio from that. The planets radiate in uh, radio microquasars, which was the topic of my thesis. But probably uh, one of the objects, okay, and pulsars, of course, um, that Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered in the uh, mid to late 1960s. And then we were all riveted, I think, watching the press conferences when the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration released the radio images of uh, uh, the black holes, first in 2019, then 2022. I'll get back to that in a minute. But um, probably the one of the targets, uh, one of the sources of radio emission that most people are familiar with are quasars. So quasars, are these objects that we know of their distant galaxies. You have the host galaxy and uh, these galaxies emit uh, the radio jets. Uh, they uh, eject matter at nearly the speed of light that extend for great distances out into the cosmos. So this is Cygnus A and the extent of the radio jets is practically, it's more than half uh, a million uh, light years. But we know this today because we have access to radio telescopes, to uh, means of collecting the radio emission from the universe. But if we didn't have that, we would just think of Cygnus A as this fuzzy little blob in amongst all the other little fuzzy and less fuzzy blobs in the universe. So it's thanks to radio astronomy that we've really learned about the structures of uh, a lot of these cosmic sources. So, just uh, to remind everybody, just to put this in context of where we are in the electromagnetic spectrum, the radio waves are at the longest wavelength end of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're all familiar with the visible here that goes from indigo to red, but that's a tiny sliver of the full electromagnetic spectrum that stretches from the highest energy, shortest wavelength gamma rays all the way through to the longest wavelength uh, radio. Radio waves can be up to kilometers in length. So just bear that in mind when we talk about the history and detection of, uh, of uh, radio waves. The neat thing about radio waves though, is that a, a chunk of them actually reach the Earth's surface. If we want to observe the universe in X-rays or gamma rays, we have to loft detectors up into orbit. Same for uh, infrared. Think about the James Webb telescope right now that's beaming back these amazing infrared images. But we have to be above the Earth's atmosphere for just about every, uh, every bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. Even the visible, we benefit from putting telescopes up high on mountaintops to get above much of the Earth's atmosphere. But with radio waves, we can, we can put these detectors and telescopes right on the surface of the Earth. 
So before 1930, our universe, the universe that we knew was largely uh, visual. So until the 1900s, we knew that there were planets out there, stars, clusters, nebulae, but we weren't really sure about how far away they were, how big they were. We had people like William Herschel, who very innovatively um, uh, manipulated his great 40 foot telescope through a system of ropes and pulleys. And he helped us learn so much about nebulae in the, in, in, in the universe. And then some people came along and they started cataloging these things and systematically recording them. Charles Messier, while he was uh, out hunting comets. and But our universe was very local. We had no idea how big it was. We had no idea how far it extended. And we didn't really know the nature of most of these objects anyway. And things started to change in the 1910s when Vesto Slipher, uh, he observed the redshift of spectral lines from galaxies. And um, another big um, innovation, actually, just stepping back a little bit, was the photographic plate. So for the first time, we could astronomers could record their data. Until uh, the invention of the photographic plate and, and the mechanism to get photographic plates, uh, astronomers either only kept written notes or they sketched things. But for now, the universe was starting to become more accessible, uh, apart from a couple of experiments in um, infrared in the 1800s, our universe was largely visual, but we were starting to record things. We were starting to uh, understand the distance scale of our universe, and we started to build more and more sophisticated instruments. But really neat, I think, is that in the 1930s, we witnessed the birth of radio astronomy. There was this chap by the name of Carl Jansky. He was a young physicist and he was an engineer. He was employed by Bell Labs. And his, his task was to investigate the sporadic static that was interfering with the nascent radio communications of the time. The radio had not invented that, uh, that much uh, earlier before this. And so to to complete this task of, of investigating this, this static, he built this amazing contraption, basically out of brass piping and timber. And it was 30 meters in length, about six meters high. And there's Jansky himself there. And he mounted it on the wheels of a Model T Ford and it rotated fully every uh, 20 minutes. So inevitably gained the nickname of Jansky's merry-go-round so he detected, he identified three types of interference and two he was able to identify immediately, local thunderstorms and distant thunderstorms. Um, oh, hang on, does somebody have their mic on? Cause I'm hearing an echo on my side. Terrific, sorry, I was I, distracted by my own voice. Um, so he called this the, the Jansky's merry-go-round. And with, with that, he was able to identify three types of interference. So two, he identified immediately, local and distant thunderstorm. But then he noted a steady hiss type of static of unknown origin. So he set out to, um, uh, 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 um, what's it called, record this. And he published a little paper in Popular Astronomy in 1933, where he showed his data, and his data, uh, he plotted it, he plotted the so-called, let's say, light curve of it, where he plotted intensity against time. And you see uh, time is here along the x-axis, intensity on the y-axis, and we also have the direction of the signal here on the, on the top uh, x-axis. And you can see that there are these peaks in intensity every 20 minutes, and that reflects the fact that his whole apparatus rotated once every 20 minutes. But what he found, so he found that there was a peak in intensity, the intensity rose and fell every day. And initially he thought that it might have been the sun, that the source of this static might have been the sun. But he noted that the peak in intensity was did not occur exactly every 24 hours. Instead, uh, the peak sort of occurred every 23 hours and 56 minutes. And you all as astronomers will recognize this time. It's very significant. So after he chatted with one of his astrophysics friends, he discarded the sun as the source of this radio emission and, um, and, and decided that the, uh, the signal came from a fixed point in space. 
And not only that, so he plotted uh, the direction of the arrival here on the y-axis and the time of day on the x-axis, and he took the data for 12 uh, consecutive months. Now, he missed out November, you'll notice, but he plotted the data for each of the months, starting in January, February, March, and he noticed that the signal came back after one whole year to the same place. So at the end of one sidereal year, curve was back in its original position. So putting these two things together, he came to only one conclusion. And this is what he quoted in his paper. To one familiar with the manner in which the heavenly bodies change their positions hourly and daily, these facts indicate that the direction of arrival is fixed in space. So now we have for the first time confirmation based on Janssen's data that there was this radio signal was of extraterrestrial origin. And it made headlines. The New York Times on May 5th published this headline, New Radio Waves Traced to Center of the Milky Way. So he had determined that the uh, di direction of arrival was somewhere around right ascension 18 hours. So now we know it's in, uh, somewhere in Sagittarius. We now know that this coincides with the center of the Milky Way. And of course, today we know that that, that big source of radio emission in our galaxy is uh, Sag J star. But so there was a lot of publicity and, um, and, and, and he went to conferences and so on. But after this first hoopla, this failed to rustle up a lot of interest. Only two years later, at a conference at which Jansky spoke, barely two dozen people attended his talk. Of course, the 1930s were a very difficult time. There was the Great Depression, lead up, it was lead up to the World War II, even if people didn't know that that was gonna happen, but still it was a very difficult time. But so um, he sort of started to uh, give up on his radio astronomy, uh, research. He was getting no more funding from Bell Labs. There was, like I said, the Great Depression. He had no formal astronomical training, so he just led it sort of like Peter off to, to, to the side. But yet we honor this great pioneer in radio astronomy today because the unit for that we use for the flux density is the Jansky. Nevertheless, some people had their ear to the ground and uh, Jansky's discovery piqued their curiosity. And here are some of the early pioneers of radio astronomy. And I think these guys are fabulous. There on the, on the left is uh, physicist John Krauss, who by the way, has written fabulous books, among them uh, Big Year, uh, all about the, the construction of the radio telescope, telescope at Ohio State. But so John Krauss and his PhD student would ride around in John's uh, 1923 Studebaker with this um, aluminum rod just sticking out the top. So the PhD student had to drive because John was in the back seat with all the recording equipment and all the data collecting stuff and so on. And they were often stopped by the police because they would just randomly drive around towns and fields and, and uh, but they always got out of trouble. And then on the right, there's what we call the Bruce type antenna named for Edmund Bruce, who also happened to be an engineer at Bell's lab at Bell Labs. And what he did was he um, ingeniously folded a wire that was about 100 meters long, and he just folded it in, um, in, in this manner and making it only one third in length, which meant that it was much more manageable to set up and, and, and work with. So these were the intrepid pioneers of uh, radio astronomy. But there's one more person that we need to mention, and that's uh, Grosa Raver. He was an electrical engineer and an amateur radio operator. And he was one of the few that was thoroughly inspired by Jansky's discovery. And so he built a nine meter, nine meter parabolic dish in his backyard. And this parabolic dish functions just like the, 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 the mirrors in, uh, in uh, regular optical telescopes. Waves from outer space come, bounce off the surface of the mirror into a secondary uh, detector uh, mount. And um, so he built this in his backyard and he was only the second person after Jansky to make these radio astronomical measurements. Uh, and uh, the first to use, the he introduced basically the parabolic dish idea. And incredibly, he was the only active radio astronomer from 1937 until after World War II. But in, um, in exploring you know, Jansky's early pioneering efforts, what uh, Grote was able to do with the parabolic dish was go from just sort of like light, cur like fl light curves showing the intensity, uh, the variation of intensity in time to making, to constructing two dimensional maps. So he, here we have one of uh, Raber's maps of the galaxy and he noted 
a peak in intensity that near the galactic center, a peak in intensity in the constellation Cygnus that we now know is Cygnus A, which was the galaxy I showed at the beginning, and a peak in intensity in the constellation Cassiopeia, which we now know is the supernova remnant. So World War II comes along, interrupts lots of people's lives, uh, scientific efforts, um, of course, kills many people. But one of the things that happened during World War II was that radar technology developed in leaps and bounds. And there were several countries that really focused their efforts on uh, radar technology, developing radar technology, the British, uh, the American, and the Australians. And this is important because, okay, first little side sidestep. There was one person who uh, continued with scientific work, and that was uh, the British physicist, James uh, Hay. And his main job was to monitor the Germans' radar jamming activities. He was there perched on the cliffs of Dover, pointing his uh, equipment at uh, wherever the Germans might be doing their thing. And on the day, two days of February 27 and 28 in 1942, this widespread daytime jamming was um, caused an interference of such an intensity as to make his radar operation absolutely impossible. But he noticed that the direction of the maximum interference followed the sun. And after sending off a couple of telegrams to Greenwich uh, Royal Observatory and, and, and uh, calling people and talking with people, somebody told him that the Royal Observatory down in uh, South Africa at the Cape of Good Hope had obtained images of the sun and showed that there was this active region just on these days. So this was the first time that somebody had uh, made a radio observation of the sun. It happened to be during wartime and it happened to be you know, with, 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 with an anti-aircraft radar. But now we move down to the Southern hemisphere and we go to Australia. The Australians, uh, as I mentioned, they were very keen on developing radar technology. But after the war, there were all these unused radars just lying around. So a couple of people from, uh, the, from CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization that leads all scientific research in Australia, a couple of people, inc including Rudy, Ruby Payne Scott, they got together and they devised this ingenious experiment. So they put a radar on top of a cliff by the sea and um, they observed the sun. They, 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 they pointed the, the antenna toward the sun and they noticed that uh, they were getting not only the signal, the direct signal from the sun, but also the reflected signal off the sea, uh, surface of the sea, if it was calm, it had to be a calm sea. So the reflected signal as well, which effectively, if you continue the vector of the incoming solar ray here effectively gave them a baseline of 200 meters. So with the trick of the reflection, they basically had like a telescope that was 200 meters wide. And they did phenomenal research with this. They, uh, they imaged the sun, they recognized all these areas of activity on the solar surface, and they published tons of papers and uh, in, in the late 40s and early 50s. So now we're really getting a sense that radio astronomy is coming into, into itself. And uh, I continue with the Aussie contributions because I have a very direct um, connection with Australia that I'll, I'll mention in a bit. Um, another one of the big pioneers of radio astronomy was Bernard Mills. And he built what he called the Mills Cross in 1954. And it was nothing more complicated then two arms that ran north, south, east, west. Each arm was just about uh, 1,500 feet long. And all it was was two rows of halfway dipole elements that were backed by a wire mesh reflector. That's all it was. And he built this and he did many observations with that. Then um, built a larger version called the Malonglo Cross that he built uh, just outside of Canberra. And the Malonglo cross then became, it was a cross, so they got rid of one arm and they added it to the other arm and they made the uh, Malonglo Observatory Synthesis Telescope. And this is a cylindrical paraboloid that's uh, almost 800 meters long. And uh, this is the wonderful thing about doing astronomy in Australia is that you have these big wide open spaces, you can put these massive telescopes there and you have wildlife everywhere. You have all kinds of uh, really neat wildlife. And so the Malongo Observatory Synthesis Telescope is not only in itself like a very low maintenance 
um, uh, uh, device, but also the maintenance of the grounds was 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 uh, was very low maintenance. They just used the sheep to mow the lawn. They'd release the sheep, and the sheep would wander and graze, and no lawn mowing to do. And uh, the, to, this is a, a side a side view of the actual paraboloid that uh, extends for about eight hundred meters down. It's absolutely fabulous instrument. They've now it was built in. Um, so the, the Malonglo Cross, I think, was built in the late 60s. And in 1978, it became the Malonglo uh, Observatory Synthesis Telescope. It's been operating since then. And now they've even upgraded it. And it's doing, uh, it's involved in the fast radio burst research and so on. Just this little wire mesh thingy here. Unbelievable. I find it incredible. So uh, this is why Australia is very dear to my heart. I, uh, as some of you may have, recognized my last name Hanekainen is a Finnish last name. My father's from Finland, and but I didn't grow up in Finland. And so when it came time for me to do my PhD uh, research, I was trying to find places, you know, I was trying to think where to go. And I thought, okay, I'll go to Finland and explore some of my roots. So the only thing is that you quickly learn that Finland has very long and cold winters. This is the view from my office window in January, that's snow. That's the level of the snow right up to the window. Okay, it wasn't, I mean, that was the snow that had piled up. It wasn't up to, you know, our foreheads all the way outside, but I would say it was up to mid thigh at least. So there's a lot of, while I was doing uh, travels between um, uh, collaborators in France and so on, I met a lovely chap called Professor Richard Hunstead, who was a professor at Sydney University. And he invited me to uh, go and do some research with him to, to, for, for my PhD work. And uh, I did not hesitate. I said yes straight away because this was the view like the day before I left for Australia. And this was the view outside my digs just a few days later in January. So this began a lifelong love for the beautiful country of Australia. And the other reason that it's so fabulous is that, like I said, wildlife, there's wildlife everywhere. There's wildlife that tries to kill you. There's wildlife that is just so pretty. And then there's wildlife that goes and bounces right past your, your radio telescopes. I absolutely love that. This was not my video, but I saw very similar scenes with my own eyes. So that was Australia, a little chapter on Australia, always dear to my heart and mainly incredible uh, pioneers in, in radio astronomy. But radio astronomy has a lot of challenges. The main challenge being, as I mentioned earlier, radio waves are long. We are talking centimeters to meters to kilometers. Now, one of the things we look for in astronomy that I think all of you as astronomers know very well is that in order to get as much great, as great detail as possible, uh, of our observing targets in order to be able to get as much detail as possible of our observing targets. What we want is high resolution. To get high resolution, resolution is a very simple formula. The uh, level of re resolution is simply the wavelength lambda over the diameter D of your um, detecting instrument, whatever instrument you're using to capture light waves, optical waves, ultraviolet waves, and radio waves. So you can see immediately that if you have very long wavelengths, you will need a very big D or diameter to make theta as small as possible. And that's what you want because the smaller theta is, the more detail you can probe of your cosmic source. The paraboloid dishes developed a lot since Graeber's time. This is now 1988. So we're talking 50 years after Graeber built that sweet little nine meter uh, paraboloid dish in his backyard. This is the green bank, 300 foot, so 100 meter across diameter dish. So we're trying to go big. We're going big because we need to capture these big, long radio waves. But building big poses its own challenges. You have physics that equals gravity. Gravity is dangerous for big things, as are high winds. Weather, we can't do anything about the weather. These are two things we can't do anything about. So in fact, the day after this picture on the right was on the left was taken, there was a catastrophic collapse of the Green Bank 300 foot telescope. And that's because it is difficult to build something that is that big. They rebuilt it. Uh, 
It's now called the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Radio Telescope. It's there. It's gorgeous. It's um, 485 feet tall, right up to the top to the to the secondary focus. But it's still only 300 feet across. It's just tough to build something that's a single structure that is that big. There's only one other radio telescope that that's big that is that big, that is a fully steerable, freestanding radio telescope. And that's in Effelsberg in Germany, and that too is. Uh, 300 meter, uh, 300 feet across. Hmm. Excuse me. There are larger dishes, or should I say, there were, mm, uh, including Arecibo in Puerto Rico. But they are dishes that were built into natural um, uh, depressions in in <clears throat> in the ground, and they're not fully steerable. This guy here, you can point anywhere in the in the sky, whereas with the um, a recibo, you just have to wait for your targets to pass overhead. So how do we get the bigger diameters for radio telescopes so that we can capture these radio waves and get, get the appropriate resolution to start probing detail? So one way to do that is to put lots of radio dishes together. And that essentially was what Ruby Payne Scott and her colleagues had done. They had ushered in the era of interferometry. Unwittingly, and maybe using the sea as a reflector, excuse me, but they had basically introduced the concept, which is as follows. Um, when you can combine lots of radio dishes together, they effectively act as one single large diameter uh, telescope. So the VLA is a, um, a telescope that I think you all know very well. Uh, excuse me, I'm just going to grab some cough syrup. Sorry, I had a cold this week and my voice is starting to give out. Um, I think we're all familiar with the very large array that is now called the Carl G. Jansky in honor of Jansky. Very large array. It's in Socorro, New Mexico. And it consists of 25, no, 27 dishes each of 25 meters in diameter and they are mounted on these tracks and the tracks serve a purpose the dishes can be moved either farther out or closer into the center and the vla has four main configurations the most compact configuration when you have all 27 dishes all bunched up together in the middle has an extent of only about one kilometer or 0.6 miles and when you spread all the dishes as far apart as possible, we can get a telescope, effectively a telescope of 36 kilometers in diameter. So now we're talking. Now we're starting to, to really probe some of the, the fine detail in our cosmic sources. <coughs> For comparison here, you have the uh, control room and uh, some little cars and everything. So, uh, I'm going to show you an example of what a cosmic source looks like when it is viewed at each one of these configurations, A, B, C, and D. And you might ask, you know, why don't you just keep it at 0.6 miles uh, or one kilometer across? Why don't you just leave it at 36 kilometers across? There's a reason. Each one of these configurations probes different structures within your cosmic source. So we'll take a look at the radio galaxy Hercules A. And we'll take a look at it uh, when it is in its when the telescope is in its most compact configuration, i.e., configuration D. This is the image that we get. We notice these lobes, the radio lobes. We know the galaxies in there somewhere, and we see these radio lobes, and they look pretty fuzzy. They're big, uh, but we see the structure. We're going to go up in configuration. We're now going to see what it looks like at three kilometers when the telescopes are all three kilometers across. We start to see the detail of the central radio galaxy. We start to see detail in the lobes. We're probing more and more detail now in this galaxy. We go up one to the 11 kilometer. And notice now we're seeing the, the radio jet is, is very narrow. We're really starting to get the, the high energy, higher energy, um, uh, sources here of where the jet is 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 spewing out of the galaxy at these um, 
near re relativistic uh, velocities. And then we go to the highest config high, uh, largest configuration, and you really see the fine, fine detail. And so this is the marvelous thing about this is that we put all these together, all of these together, and we get a much more complete picture of the galaxy. This is the optical image uh, superposed on the radio image. But without those four configurations, we would not know that the, 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 the jet is so collimated right as it leaves the galaxy. We would just imagine it to be uh, just these fuzzy blobs. But instead, by having, by layering all of this information, we get this very detailed picture. And then we can start to analyze, you know, are we seeing shock waves here? How are the, how are, are the magnetic field lines? Are they uh, dictating some of the, the, the um, uh, uh, what's happening here between the lobes and the jets? You know, what's going on here? So we're only able to do that because we can put all of that information together. But there's a catch. And that is that radio interferometry is very, very tricky. So when you have, okay, this is just a diagram that just shows two antennae. When you have 27 antennae, you have got to correlate all the signals that come to each one of these individual dishes. So what you do, you've got your cosmic radio wave that is coming from outer space. And when it hits your detectors, it'll hit one detector first and then uh, another detector later. What radio astronomers have to do is they have to reconstruct the signal. So they get one signal in one antenna, another signal in another antenna with a time delay. So what astronomers, radio astronomers have to do to be able to derive any meaningful physics from this incoming signal, they have to be able to reconstruct it so that it looks like what it did when it came from space. They need to adjust for this delay in the arrival of the signal. And they do that by using a thing called a correlator. This is the correlator for the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in, um, uh, in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, that is uh, operated by the European Southern Observatory with partners. And this consists of, of, of tens of hundreds of dishes. And this is the correlator for the ALMA. And um, every single one of these cables is doing something. And every single one of these cables is trying to make that signal that arrives at each one of these dishes coherent so that we can reconstruct the physics that is at the source of uh, these cosmic radio waves. But so we have the, the ALMA in Chile. We have the very large array in the United States. We have uh, the Australia Telescope Compact Array in Australia. But we don't need to stop at one country. What we can do is we can combine the radio dishes across continents in a process that's known as very long baseline interferometry. So there are three primary VLBI uh, networks on the planet. There's the very long baseline array, which <clears throat> is uh, uh, across the, the continent of, of uh, across the, the US from the easternmost dish that's in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands and the westernmost dish is in Hawaii. And here we have the very large array in New Mexico. We have dishes in Arizona, California, and I believe that's the one up here in Massachusetts. And then a couple dotted here. And so effectively, these dishes that can operate alone, so you can employ just one of these dishes and do your, your own little observing today or tomorrow, but you can also link these across the country and you end up with a radio telescope that is has a diameter from Hawaii to the Virgin Islands. Same here in Europe, you have uh, the, the European VLBI network stretching from Finland down to Sicily uh, and across, and uh, South Africa has decided to join the European network. So they have one telescope, uh, one dish or a series of dishes that contribute to that. So we can get a baseline that goes from Northern Europe to Southern Africa. But for the most part, the European VLBI is concentrated here. And then the, there's the East Asian VLBI network. But what you can do is not just use these networks independently, but you can link some of the telescopes from each of these, uh, these networks um, at any one time, let's say from Europe, Europe to the US. And you effectively have a radio telescope now that is the diameter of the Earth. 
Now you can really start doing some neat things. And guess what? That's exactly what people did. The Event Horizon Telescope collaboration linked up several of these uh, dishes I was talking about. Uh, IRAM in uh, France, or is it Spain? Spain, uh, the Alma in, uh, in Chile, and then some of these, the Hawaiian uh, dish and so on, they, they linked these telescopes around the world to form this one mega telescope so that they could point it at M87 and bring us this amazing image of uh, the black hole and its accretion disk at the heart of M87. And I think we all saw, we must have all been riveted watching the, um, the press uh, conference uh, earlier this year in spring, when they revealed the image of uh, our own black hole, Sad J star. So here's a little, uh, little animation just to show that as baselines come in, as we get more telescopes, we get more coverage of the source and we can reconstruct the image better. With one or two points, you don't have an image, but when you start collecting all of this data from these baselines, you can start reconstructing a proper image. And that's exactly what they, they did. So then you could ask, um, where do we go from here? In terms of arrays, we have the square kilometer array that is now being constructed uh, between Australia and South Africa. Western Australia specifically, they've, um, uh, they've, uh, they've started building uh, Using, using the vast emptiness of Australia, they've started uh, installing all of these dishes in South Africa as well. So this is an array that will straddle two continents. And uh, the VLA, the very large array, is being revamped as well. And the next generation uh, VLA, I think it's, it's due to go online in just a few years time. Uh, if I remember correctly, towards the end of the 20s, I believe, they're going to have 20, 244 dishes instead of the 27, and each, each of 18 meters on a baseline that is now 200 times longer than now. They're still going to keep the, the original VLA that will sort of work as the hub, but they're going to add these other dishes uh, to the whole um, system. But... Uh, we, do, we needn't stop on the surface of the Earth. We've also lobbed a couple of uh, radio antennae into space. The Japanese had a very successful mission, now called HALCA, but I absolutely loved their original acronym. Cognac lovers among you will, will recognize it. So they, they, they put together VLBI Space Observatory Program. They called it VSOP. Uh, the Russian had Spectre R, which uh, ceased operations not that long ago, only about four or five years ago, I believe. And uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration are planning on lobbing an antenna either into Earth orbit or the moon. I'm not sure that's been decided yet, but that's happening. And so then we might as well ask, OK, so we've lobbed an antenna into space. Can we go farther? Yes, we can. There are plans to install um, uh, a wire mesh uh, inside a crater on the moon. It'll be called, a, well, now it's currently called the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope. And um, they're going to find a, a, a crater that is uh, about three to five kilometers in diameter and just suspend a wire mesh. So very similar to the concept of the Malonglo Observatory Telescope, the, the Mills Cross and so on, just use a wire mesh and, and some detectors and stuff. And the reason this lunar telescope, if it goes forward, will be amazing is because we'll be able to access the longest wavelength radio waves that we that that um, we cannot detect because of Earth's ionosphere. So these this very longest end of the spectrum, we will be able we should be able to detect those with this telescope on the moon. And that would open up a whole new area of astronomy, whole new area, not just radio astronomy, but astronomy in general. And who knows what new physics we might get out of this. So that's very exciting. And I do hope that that goes ahead. So as I near the end, I just want to remind everybody that um, radio astronomy needn't only be for the professionals. There is a Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, SARA, they have regular annual conferences. You can go to their webpage, uh, 
GPS um, radio astronomy with a hyphen dot org. And they've uh, uploaded all the previous, uh, certainly the virtual conferences. And um, apparently it's, it's, uh, it's a thriving community. I myself haven't dipped into it yet. I think I'm very tempted to uh, one day, but you don't need much complicated equipment. You know, a lot of people might be a, a little bit um, daunted by the idea, but this is a, a, a radio, uh, uh, no, radio TV satellite dish that some clever person repurposed. And they're doing radio astronomy with this. And uh, here's um, a, a dish I think that you can buy. Yeah, radio astronomy supplies you can buy, have it in your backyard, and you can start doing radio astronomy right there in your backyard. Uh, good thing about it is you don't have to stay up at night. You know, if you could go to bed early and observe during the day. Uh, but um, yeah, that's 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 an aspect that I think I'd I'd be curious to look into. So if any of you are already amateur radio astronomers, please let me know. And if you uh, decide to go down this path, do drop me a line at some point. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, with that, I think I sort of raced through this. I apologize. I was just so excited about talking about all of this. So I just want to say thank you. Not only do we scientists and astronomers find radio telescopes fascinating, but so does popular culture because uh, radio telescopes have featured in a couple of blockbusters. I'm sure you've all seen Contact with Jodie Foster that featured the VLA and GoldenEye that featured the now defunct Arecibo. But maybe you don't know about the dish. It's an delightful Australian movie about the Park 64 uh, meter uh, telescope. And um, it's all about the uh, the Apollo missions and how the parks, parks and other Australian telescopes, radio dishes were involved in the communications when uh, the, the when when the earth had turned and, and the US and the other tracking stations were on the other side of the of the earth. So the Australians had to step in. And the dish is a delightful movie that covers exactly uh, that period. So if you if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend uh, that you that you try and, and see that. And so that's it. Thank you very much. Diana, that was that was great. And, and boy, we have to have you back again sometime. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I'm sure there's there's any number of topics and in, in more detail that, that you could go into. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask the audience, uh, feel free to unmute or raise your hand, and if you have any questions for Diana, please, please ask now. Uh, any comments about uh, listening to Jupiter? Oh, that is really cool. I have not... I have not participated in any of that. Have you? Well, uh, inadvertently, a couple of times, uh, s several decades ago, let's say two, three decades ago, uh, I heard this waterfall sound just sound like more interference than usual on the 15 meter band, at, which I later found out was uh, Jupiter. Uh, and then I hadn't heard it for a number of years. And, uh, um, but uh, last winter, uh, I was trying to, again, on 15 meters, uh, trying to listen uh, to some stations, but there was some interference that was so loud, I, it, I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't work anybody. And it sounded like uh, an, our electric fence that my wife puts around the garden, uh, and it sounded like the snapping from that, but this was in the winter, the electric, electric fence was down, it was not uh, right. operational. And uh, I... I was doing some uh, checking to see where it was coming from. I, I thought maybe I had a problem with one of my radios. I listened to another radio, same frequency. I was hearing the same thing. Uh, I switched antennas and it went away. So I thought it was a problem with uh, one of my antennas, a Yagi, uh, whereas the, uh, straight, the wire dipole, I wasn't hearing it. Uh, so I figured, well, okay, in the spring, I'll go up and take care of it. And I didn't go back to 15 meters again until the spring. And it was quiet. Huh. Uh, and so I said, well, I didn't know what the problem was, but later I, I again, uh, curious about, uh, uh Jupiter, uh, if I could hear it again on 15 meters, I, I was looking on the website, on a website, uh, to see if anyone had any comments about it. And they talked about two types of, of signals from Jupiter. One was the waterfall sound that I had heard you know, in the past. Uh, but then the, the other one was the uh, the short bursts that I was hearing last winter that I didn't realize was Jupiter at the time, and I'm disappointed I didn't spend more time listening to it. Oh my gosh, so that's absolutely... 
Jupiter's Go coming up right now, so I have to start trying to listen to it again and see if I can uh, hear either of those signals. But it really was very interesting how strong that signal was. It just completely swamped uh, the, the radio stations I was trying to listen to. That is fascinating. And you have just given me an idea of something that I will look into for another time. I give a radio talk or something. That is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Uh, you can find me anyway on the Sky and Telescope website. But please let me know if you hear that again. I will. Yeah, thank you. Please do. There you go. Very good. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Danny, you don't know anything about SETI efforts uh, and how uh, the loss of Arecibo might have impacted that? Uh, I think, uh, isn't there the Allen telescope out in um, California? I think that is still being used a lot for, for that. Mm -hmm. But I believe that they are planning a new Arecibo type of replacement. And so they will, I don't, I haven't followed up on that. I was supposed to do that. And I haven't followed up on that, but I think there are rumors that they might be planning a new Arecibo type of, um, of installation and right there as well, where it was. But I think the, the Allen telescope might be, um, uh, uh, so, so the series of the array out in California that I think it was, is it Bill Allen? Uh, that he funded. I think they're still at uh, that was active not so long ago. I haven't followed up on that. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, SETI uh, uh, efforts uh, around the world? I know that they used to piggyback on a lot of radio telescope uh, 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 installations. And I don't know if you know anything about that. Not much. Um, I, I think that the, the problem with all of these, these facilities is that, as, as you know, just like with optical telescopes, there is so little time and so many people putting in big proposals for um, uh, long-term monitoring, long-term this and that. So I don't actually know what the status of the SETI uh, efforts are, but I think that from time to time, these, um, these facilities will uh, collaborate. I think it would be a good topic for Sky and Telescope to cover. I think they have not so long ago. <laughs> Are you hinting at something here? <laughs> no, not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I'd have to talk to our science editor. <laughs> She'd be taking care of that one. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Uh, other questions? Yeah, do we know to what degree uh, radio astronomers are concerned with all of the Starlink satellites? I don't know. I don't think astronomers, radio astronomers are terribly concerned with that, but they're more concerned with uh, with terrestrial uh, frequency usage. And in fact, it's it's one of the uh, one of the one of the challenges that radio astronomy faces besides the structural, it is protecting the frequencies for radio astronomy. And um, uh, there are very active groups that go to their 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 local uh, government, to their their senators and so on, saying we have to protect because more and more of these frequencies are being used for all of these various mobile phone things and so on. And I know that when mobile phones first started, um, I, uh, well, no, I was visiting Malonglo uh, before they realized no, this was after. Okay, so somebody told me the story. I was at Malangla, but somebody told me the story of how when mobile phones first started being more used, how they hadn't protected the radio telescope area, the area around. So cars were just driving by, you know, driving right past the telescope like they always did, because there was never any interference before. And then one day somebody was looking at their at their printout, you know, with the, the synthesis map, and there was this great big right down the middle. And they said, you know, what is that? And then a couple of days later, you know, there was another one. So all of their data was being ruined. And then they somebody realized, ah, oh, we're operating at 843 megahertz, which is exactly the sort of frequency for one of these. And so then they they created this, I don't know how wide uh, protected area around the telescope. So every radio telescope today has this huge area around it. Um, and um, that which is a which is a quiet zone, mobile phone and and 
all other kinds of radio interference. And then there are funny stories of uh, microwaves as well. I think the compact, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, somebody kept noticing, that links in with a SETI story. Somebody was noticing this really weird uh, regular signal and thought that they had come upon something very exciting. And it turned out that, and I think it was years before they figured out, it was the microwave oven in the astronomer's sort of like kitchen. <laughs> but there are huge effort, like it is something that um, uh, radio astronomers are very concerned about. And there are global efforts to try and protect those few frequencies. Very good. Uh, Diana, I have a question. I was looking at one of your slides. Are there uh, wavelengths shorter than gamma rays? Not that well. We I don't know how. I guess we we I don't we go as short as the whatever atomic uh, thingy allows. I I don't know. And I think we just call we just call them gamma rays until until out there. If you find any, let me know. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? For Diana. Diana, thank you very much. I enjoyed this immensely. And then judging by the by the questions, and there was there was great interest. So thank you. And I'd like to just say that if if I can, you know, when you're all meeting in person, I would love to come back and I will talk more slowly because I talk more slowly when I'm 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 in front of an audience. <laughs> Because I feel that I just sort of race through that, but that's because like I'm so excited about all this, and maybe next time I can cover some of the science of radio astronomy. But I would love to come back at some point and see you all in person again. Way to go! Uh, in the maybe in the spring, let's let's do something. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I love seeing you all. And I do hope that next time uh, we can we can all meet up. Thank all you, right. Diane. Thanks, Thank Diane. Diane. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.